Thank you all for coming, those of you in the room and those of you on Zoom as well. Um, I'm very excited today uh, to have a good friend and colleague, Masuki. Um, I'm going to just uh, welcome you from the Center for Law and Social Change here at City Law School. Uh, so uh, Mazen and Susanna and Santosh are co-directors of the Center. And we are doing some interesting events, but we also try to um, actively um, put forward an anti-racist, decolonial, feminist um, practice when it comes to law and social change. Um, so I'm going to introduce Susanna, who will um, introduce Pasuki in turn, <laughs> and uh, then Pasuki will speak, um, and then we'll have the q and for all of us. And those of us on uh, Zoom, um, we will um, be in, uh, I will manage the Zoom chat, so if you want to raise any questions, I'll be responding to that on Zoom, and we can also participate via Zoom in the conversation. Okay, thank you. And uh, Susanna is um, Rafa Gershman, sorry, I'm mispronouncing that after all these years. Um, one of my PhD students here at City, and one of the um, co-directors of the Centre, and you'll be introducing and sharing today's event. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's my great honor to present Professor Basuki Nesaya today. So Professor Nesaya teaches human rights, legal and social theory at the NYU Gallatin, where she's also a faculty director of the Gallatin Global Fe uh, Fellowship in Human Rights. Uh, she published on the history and politics of human rights, humanitarianism, um, international criminal law, reparations, global feminism, and decolonization. She has a number of book projects, uh, including International Conflict Feminism and uh, Reading the Ruins, uh, Colonialism, Slavery, and International Law. She is a founding member of uh, Third World Approaches to International Law, also known as TWAO. And she's co-editing TWAO, a handbook with Anthony Engi, uh, Professor Kim Chimney, Michael Farty, and Carrie Michelson. Today, uh, Professor Basuki will present a lecture entitled A Genocide by Any Other Name Would Smell as a Foul. She will touch on the Ahero genocide in German South Southwest Africa and the recent Namibian intervention at the ICJ genocide case brought by South Africa regarding Gaza. Professor Basuki will talk for about 45 minutes and then we'll open for some Q&A. Without no further ado, Professor Basuki Nassai. Great, thank you so much, um, Susanna, for that uh, wonderful introduction and to Susanna and Gretchen and City Law School for this invitation. Uh, this is uh, very much a work in progress. Um, I presented this in November and I know a couple of you at least were there as well at LSE uh, when I, did sort of a first draft of this. Um, so you're gluttons for punishment, clearly, uh, because you're now so you're going to sit through it again. Um, I put it aside in some ways um, until this week. So I, I have, um, as I revisited it for our conversation uh, today, and now I need to sort of work more intensively on it because I have submitted to the journal next, uh, version next month. But um, or to say that your feedback and reflections would be greatly appreciated. So, um, so I'm looking forward, looking forward to that. Um, yeah, I will talk about 42 minutes, I think, at last count, um, and would welcome all comments, criticisms, engagements. Um, I should also apologize in advance because as the months have worn on since I did the first draft to now, it's hasn't the, the draft itself hasn't changed much. I took away some things, but um, as I read it again this week, um, I founding myself. Um, ending in more despair than hope. So I think I was slightly more hopeful in November and now it's um, not less so. Um, I was beginning to work on the Herero and Nama reparations claims when I started thinking about the, 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 the talk at LSE last year. I mean, I was asked to give it. So, um, and then sort of mid-September, I finally gave them the topic um, and I decided to talk about the German genocide against the Herero and Nama. Um, and then, um, and at that time, the Jackie Sobris uh, jury play that was also about genocide. For reasons of, le of length, I have excised the references to the play in what I'm going to present today, but I'm happy to discuss it as well in Q&A. 
Um, in any case, three weeks later, after I'd sort of decided on the topic and given them the title, we were in the early days of the threat of genocide. Um, and today we are already five months into it with over 30,000 people killed, hospitals and schools destroyed. Um, the slow death of malnutrition has already been taking place much faster than we had anticipated. Um, so we are in a very, very different um, place, although perhaps we were already on this trajectory um, at the time. Um, <clears throat> the, um, and in many ways, the talk, I mean, talk today is, you know, is really about, about on the one hand, about the Herero and Nama um, in Namibia, but of course the question of um, Gaza sort of haunts it. Um, and uh, even if um, even if not always explicitly referred to, I'm, I'm sure it shaped um, it shaped my writing of this and thinking thinking about it in many, many ways. Um, the apex crimes of status of genocide in international law suggests that of, <clears throat> of all the kinds of atrocities that international law denounces, it receives its most staunch censure for racist atrocity. Charges of genocide are heard across the world when communities, especially minority communities, disenfranchised communities, want the international community to recognize grave abuse. It is in this context that genocide has become sort of a talismanic goal for the Herero and Nama communities or what is now in Namibia. Um, and in discussing um, my own approach to genocide and partly perhaps explaining the title, um, rather than approach genocide with the question, is it genocide or is it not a genocide? You know, the question that was posed to Lisa J. I want to foreground the multiple meanings of genocide, put them in conversation and think with their unsettled and unsettling tensions, sort of the meaning of genocide in law was in ethics, colonial, racial, the immediate goals of gen gen uh, genocide claims sometimes, which are amelioration and the larger structural goals, uh, long-term goals of social change, um, genocide is a story about victors, and genocide is a story about perpetrators. Genocide is a story about Europe and a story about the colony, um, the political economy of genocide, genocide as the framework through which appropriation and dispossession happens, genocide as race making, and genocide as racial annihilation. Um, I'm sort of interested also, perhaps, in as a as a last point, as a preface, um, in sort of the parallel unsettling with historical reference of genocide. And in this case, let me be at the beginning of the century and the genocide against the Jews of Europe in the middle of the century, but of course haunted by the foreshadowing, we might say, of the genocide we are living in, um, living through today. <clears throat> so first, let me begin with just some historical context of the claims for reparations for genocide in Namibia. In 1904, just 20 years after the Berlin Conference had awarded Namibia to Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm's emissary, General Van Trotha, began issuing extermination orders that resulted in the killing of over 75% of the Herero and 50% of the Nama in less than four years. This record of mass extermination has been the basis of a long-term campaign to get the German government to recognize it had committed genocide and that it owed surviving Herero and Nama communities reparations. They have called on the German government to recognize the genocide they suffered under German colonialism and give expression to that recognition through reparations. In May 2021, the German government officially acknowledged the genocide and announced a $1 billion package of aid to the Namibian government. Germany's use of the word genocide was itself a result of extensive pressure over many years from the Herero and Nama communities, the Namibian government, and human rights groups from across the world. Yet even in this acknowledgement, the German government clarified that they intended a political acknowledgement rather than taking legal responsibility. Accordingly, its $1 billion was titled Development Aid for Reconstruction and Reconciliation Efforts rather than Reparations. Lines of genocide and nationhood intersected and diverged in ways that brought different interests to the fore in Namibia. The predominantly Ovambo ruling party Swapo was invested in a larger development aid package and described this as a form of reparations for German colonialism. In contrast, the political representatives of the Herero and Nama community rejected development aid as constituting reparations for the genocide. And maybe that's sort of, you know, one kind of marker that of, of the question I was thinking about um, at the beginning, how colonialism and genocide also gets uh, separated as two alternative and in fact competing, um, uh, competing ways in which to talk about atrocity. Um, through the um, the, the weight the, the way in the baggage we get with the genocide discourse. 
The Herrera and Nama genocide claims draws attention to the experience in ways that talking about German colonialism alone does not. While nations have claimed a certain monopoly over political voice, of the formerly colonized, genocide provided them an avenue to thinking beyond the nation state to the alternative political societies of the pre-colonial political landscape. Political societies such as the Herero and Nama and other indigenous communities and minority communities world over, whose plural political voices are muffled and sometimes muzzled um, in a society of nations. Many claims for reparations for colonialism and slavery are negotiating a tension between the immediate claims of claimants seeking to ameliorate the ongoing injustices of the afterlives of these systems, as well as broader goals of exposing the structural and ongoing weight of these afterlives. Moreover, they may look to international law for a language with which to make these claims audible, but international law itself may, may itself be symptomatic of the world made by colonialism and slavery, rather than a stable ground from which to critique that world order. These tensions and paradoxes haunt most oppression claims, including the claims brought by the Herero and Nama that will preoccupy us today. In negotiating these tensions, developing a political strategy around reparations involves political analysis and social movement work that is specific to the communities and context involved. My intervention today is slightly different and may or may not be useful in that effort. Namely, it is about performing a distributive analysis of alternative framings of genocide. And to that end, I turn now to examining the received approach to genocide and better understanding its legal and political work in framing the legacies of German colonialism and the experience of the Herero and Nama. So the life of the Genocide Convention, sort of before and after its birth in some ways. <coughs> Excuse me. The passage of the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide on 9th December 1948 marks the first contribution of the newly formed United Nations to the human rights and humanitarian law field. It is followed the very next day by the passage of the Universal Declaration for Human Rights and within a year by the Geneva Conventions. The UDHR and the Geneva Conventions invoke race only passively in their non-discrimination clauses. It is a genocide convention that places race front and center. In fact, the condemnation of racism is often seen as a core to the convention's resonature. This condemnation is both a repudiation of the Holocaust and a redemption of the moral authority of international law. Indeed, the Genocide Convention is a primary international law instrument addressing race for over two decades. The International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination comes into force only 20 years later on 4th January 1969. Yet from the beginning, there has been a tension between two potential lives of genocide, the of the Genocide Convention. The first is the Genocide Convention as part of the post-war global governance regime commemorating the memory of the Shoah by accruing humanitarian capital to the new world order. Right? So that's life one. The second or alternative life of the convention is as a re resource for anti-racist struggles the world over. Imperfect and not always fit for pur purpose, but nevertheless valuably translating sometimes local struggles into global conversations and at the limit point, becoming that talismanic call to interrupt the routines of world order. Very early in its life, these two alternative visions of the Genocide Convention came into conflict. The American Civil Rights Congress submitted a report to the United Nations titled We Charge Genocide that documented American anti-Black racism by every branch of government and its accompanying genocidal history from lynching to police violence. So this was you know, right, right, right soon after the Genocide Convention was passed. This report was ignored by the UN and became yet another entry into an archive of lost, forgotten, and suppressed genocides. Clearly holding the US accountable involved a greater challenge to the dominant world order than the machinery of anti-genocide lawyering permitted. So it, you can see the clear tension between those sort of two alternative um, potential futures of the Genocide Convention. The Genocide Convention also poses other challenges for justice struggles. It monopolizes all attention in ways that neglects and even licenses atrocities that don't fall within its sort of narrow definition. Or even the slow violence that is routine and systemic rather than characterized by spectacular horror. It encourages framing of atrocities within the matrix of genocide to get attention for their cause. Moreover, the invocation of genocide generates what Dirk Moses calls a total security logic that empowers other atrocities. Within the particular context of Germany, genocide has a very particular history that Nahid Samur and others have drawn attention to. Namely, the Germany's admission and responsibility for genocide is predicated on European victims. 
the category of genocide is itself one that entails racially loaded categories of innocence and guilt. So that even calling Palestinians victims of genocide becomes unacceptable amongst those invested in Germany or Europe as the arbiter of how the humanitarian capital associated with the term should be distributed. <clears throat> so on that note, let me turn a little bit to Holocaust reparations and sort of shadow shadowing of this Nama, uh, uh, the Nama and Herero conversations. Germany's Holocaust reparations and acknowledgements recur as a reference point for Namibian demands. During, um, during the course of the Herero and Nama reparations campaign, the Holocaust and Germany's response to it in subsequent decades is repeatedly invoked. It reflects the dominant approach of much of genocide studies and international law in treating the Holocaust as the yardstick, the sort of ultimate criterion for assessing the scope, methods, targets, and victims of other genocides. That's, uh, the quote was from Barbara Huff. It has also emerged as a reference point from which to measure and condemn Germany's action and inaction regarding the Herero and Nama claims. For instance, the human rights scholar and activist Maka Mutua has drawn attention to the contradictions between Germany's approach to the Herero and Nama genocide and Germany's post-Holocaust justice initiatives. He explained post-Holocaust justice initiatives as not only a story about the gravity of the Holocaust, but also a story about how to address atrocities that occurred in the heart of Europe. The inadequacy of the German government's response to the Herero and Nama reframed their Holocaust reparations as not just a story about victims, but centrally a story about white victims. Thus, we once again see the global governance approach to genocide triumph over challenges to it. Perhaps the framing of genocide in terms of the extermination orders already takes us down that path. Extermination orders against the Herero and Nama resonates with the dominant framing of the Shoah and this focus on extreme and spectacular violence is often urgent and necessary, but it is not without cost. The retrospective focus on Van Trotha's extermination orders also works to, <coughs> um, works to describe racist lawfare and social construction of race, or to abstract uh, racist lawfare and the social construction of race from the material economies of land. My focus in what follows is, ex in, is exploring how we might tell the story of genocide if we interrogate race making and the distributive logics of the genocide framing. Who profits, who loses? What is the currency of profit and loss? What genocide is called the apex crime of racist atrocity in international law, is that a racial logic that is baked into the framing of that term? Okay. So on that, in exploring that particular question about the racial logic that perhaps are embedded within how genocide has got framed, I turn to um, look at genocide and the scramble for land in Namibia. Germany's extermination orders uh, against the Herero and Nama I cited as evidence of the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. Right? That's meeting the genocide convention's requirements that we will focus on prejudicial intent. The military consequences of the extermination order underscores the genocidal consequences of colonial po uh, policy with a scale of lives loss. By 1910, only 20% of the Herero population survived. However, the focus on the extermination order also does a different kind of work. It disconnects destruction from dispossession and distills structure into an event. While it foregrounds the brutality of the racism, the focus on the extermination order treats the property regimes inaugurated by colonialism as either motivation or consequence of the violence, rather than as it itself a project of race making, as itself part of what genocide is about. Property is, of course, central to the plot, and the scramble for land emerges as both the immediate prequel and denouement in this story. In traditional genocide studies, there has been an attempt to come to grips with the land question of settler colonialism by focusing on the way the relationship to land may be an integral part of a community's identity. So Article 2, Clause C of the Genocide Convention, for instance, speaks of genocidal acts as including deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. In this way, students of the Genocide Convention have spoken of its relevance to the genocide of indigenous people because the appropriation of land destroyed the conditions needed for their thriving and cultural survival. While the cultural genocide argument leans into a fetishized and a historical representation of the relationship between indigenous people and land, it also treats the cultural and racial cohesion of a community as already formed and warranting respect for preservation and cultural survival. There is what some scholars have described as sort of a billet board representation of culture, where communities are treated as neatly bounded holes whose contents are given and static. 
hence may need to be protected and preserved. Yet in fact, the relationship between community and property were deeply contested and notions of race, what it was to be African or what it was to be German, were partly forged through struggles over who had legitimate claims to land. Arguments for the appropriation of native land was intertwined with the race-making arguments about civilization and productivity, as well as non-recognition of customary law and the complex tenure system of communal land ownership. In other words, race-making dynamics were forged and struggled over through the course of the colonial encounter, and property rights were often the terrain of battle. Amongst other things, the story of genocide in Namibia requires attending to how the property law and racial taxonomies were co-produced, such as lawfare redistributed land, but also created what Sheldon Harris calls a property interest in whiteness. At the time the Germans came onto the stage, the Herero were powerful actors within the regional economy of Southern Africa. Having established themselves as the premier herders and traders of cattle, they wielded considerable economic clout and saw the continued control of vast swaths of land as key to reproducing that success. <clears throat> Excuse me. Law was central to the German effort to disrupt the status quo. Using con a contract as well as administrative decree to claim possession, render local land claims invalid or vulnerable to challenge. The challenge was multi-pronged. Sometimes fraudulent or deceptive contracts, sometimes to administrative fiat, but the logic was simple. Sheryl Harris's pivotal essay, The Property Interest in Whiteness, speaks to the process of settler colonialism on the other side of the Atlantic. Yet there's a resonance with the relationship with the new property regimes that were introduced in the colonies, in the American colonies by the English, and the new regimes of racial difference and hierarchy that came in tandem. English colonial law in the Americas implemented a racially differentiated access to title. But as Harris notes, the property interest in whiteness was not simply about racial discrimination. In addition to being a dimension of identity and belonging, it was also a vested interest with legally legitimated access to the rewards and privileges that accompanied it in regard to jobs, educational opportunities, the right to live in particular places, and of course, the right to occupy and to own land. Harris points out that the privileges accorded to whiteness fit the conceptualization of property and ownership in a social and legal theory. This is Harris. The law has established and protected an actual property interest in whiteness itself, which shares the critical characteristics of property and accords with the many and varied theoretical descriptions of property. The most remarkable dimension of settler colonial story, however, is that property and race were co-constitutive. Property distribution shaped racial categories and racial categories shaped lines of accumulation and dispossession. The broad outlines of the story in the Americas can be seen as a rehearsal of how the story would unfold in Namibia and elsewhere as colonialism became a pillar of the global economy. Here I follow the analysis of many First Nation theorists and critical race theorists who look at settler colonialism as not just a global phenomenon, but as part of the structure of the world system. Um, in the American context, property and race get articulated in ways that were specific to American history. For instance, the doctrine of discovery, Locke and labor theory of value and primacy of the British crown are all important in Johnson v. Tosh, a case that ruled that First Nations people had no legitimate claim to ownership. The specific arguments invoked in the Namibian case are different in important ways. For instance, the language of civilization plays a much more significant role than the doctrine of discovery. And whiteness as articulated through German citizenship becomes much more significant. The Southern African counterpart to Johnson Wake and Tosh is the equally famous uh, re-Southern -South Rhodesia, which legitimized the dispossession of the Nebele from their lands in Matebe land on the theory that indigenous people were so inferior that it was incompatible with the notion of rights and duties that are enshrined in the property regimes of a civilized race. Despite many significant differences, the definition of property and ownership that informed the diverse settler colonial regimes in Southern Africa shared a vital kinship, not only with each other, but also with the American theory of property, in that all, in all these theaters, settler colonial law choreographed the transformation of a people into a race and a territory into a property as intertwined processes of extermination and dispossession. The categories of racial identity get forged through a repertoire of colonial laws determining who can be a legally recognized landowner and who, by definition, is illegible for ownership. By 1902, notably two years before the extermination orders I issued, only 40% of what is Namibia today was owned by Africans. The story that emerges here is not only of the instrumental value of land and survival of a race, but that race and racial difference was itself constituted through land distribution. So maybe <coughs> a detour a little bit into um, uh, this kind of German colonialism. Um, 
Germany finds its way <laughs> into colonial governance through sort of a haphazard path of private entrepreneurial adventurism and an evolving vision of racial difference and settler colonial accumulation of land and cattle. These processes in Namibia were intertwined with the path of industrialization and capitalist development in Germany. As analyzed by Rosa Luxemburg over 100 years ago, Germany is pulled into a dynamic of accumulation where the reproduction of capitalism also required an expanded market for its goods and colonization was one route to achieving that. Metropolitan industrialization required uneven development so that some sectors, in this case the colonies, were consumers uh, uh, but not producers of industrially produced commodities. Colonization could help address this problem for German industrialists. Simultaneously, industrialization also resulted in the increased shortage of arable land in Germany, and this produced its own demands for colonized territory. All these dynamics converged in favor of the colonization of Southwest Africa. Thus, in many ways, the drivers of market competition and inter-imperial rivalry were intertwined. And while it started slowly, German colonization soon intensified in terms of the scale of the colonial ambition, the military might that drove it, and the governance structures that were established. Colonies provided the raw material for industrialization, but also the consumers. Even as colonial land gets transformed through plantations and mines, colonial subjects get, interp get, get interpolated as consumers. Law was a central weapon in the colonization process with private traders and emissaries of the German government negotiating treaties with local chiefs over land rights and weaponry. The plot lines of what ensued is familiar from other theaters in other places and other times. Contract law becomes weaponized as threat, collateral and bounty. Trading clauses were aimed at dispossession and debt and protection clauses defraud and divide local communities. Colonial lawfare made way for racialized and highly militarized governance policies that unleashed a series of brutal assaults on local communities that coupled the appropriation of land with military attacks, aggressively asserting colonial authority. Notions of racial expansion and racial superiority were fused with these encounters as part animating rationale and part legitimizing rationalization. The property law regimes introduced by the Germans also rendered communal land illegitimate with new forms of private property replacing communal land use and rendering communal uh, claims illegible to the law. While colonization came late in Namibia, the process of accumulation and dispossession unfolded hard and fast, and, Germany and uh, Germans and Germany soon owned vast swaths of the land. One can see a plausible rehearsal of Lebensraum, a living space, that spoke of the manifest destiny of the German people to an expansive settler colonial agenda a notion that a few decades later would have a life in German expansion across Europe. It was also a rehearsal of the vision that motivated Jan Smuts in his pursuit and consolidation of South Africa's mandate over Namibia. As prime minister of South Africa, Smuts also aspired to be an architect of a white utopia in Southern Africa, a Monroe doctrine for the South that required an expansion of South Africa's borders to manage the people and resources of Namibia for the profit of a white-led super state in Southern Africa. Smuts, too, looked to North American narratives of race and property for inspiration. In this case, a different phase of empire, where the USA had colonial ambitions for the rest of the Americas. What is especially striking about the mandate phase of Namibia is that in 1922, just two years after South Africa had been granted mandate authority over Namibia, South Africa air-bombed the Bondelswath region of Namibia, killing over 100 people and causing widespread destruction. The bombing was preceded by a range of other draconian measures, including implementation of an onerous colonial tax system designed to make life unsustainable for the Nama community so that they could be economically coerced into working in the mines that were a central anchor of the South African economy. This was not a terra nullius argument, but an active policy of disrupting local economic productivity to annex land and transform local people into dependence of the colonial economic model. This logic was already rehearsed in the German colonial period, where historians know that the Haredo community were, at that time, the outstanding cattle breeders of, the southern, of Southern Africa. Nama groups were likewise active and successful cattle breeders and enjoyed strong trading links with farming communities in the Cape Colony. Theodor Lutwin, the German governor who remained in office until 1904, notes in his letters home that the goal was to destroy African societies as part of German economic policy. Lutwin is often contrasted to Van Trotha, who is seen as a genocidaire. Lutwin, in contrast, he's, uh, is seen as um, a kind of softer version, whose goals were economic hegemony and Germany's ambitions with the global market, rather than local and military goals. 
As one historian describes it, Lutwin agreed with prominent colonial politicians and propagandists that the Africans' lands ought to be seized and their societies shattered and transformed into a proletarian or healer class. Lutwin was in fact an opponent of Ventura's method and military priorities, but he did see local African economic systems as a threat, in particular those of groups like the Herero and Nama, whose own internal political and legal systems were well-established and self-sustaining. Again, one hears echoes of the Americas. For instance, as Patrick Wolf notes, the infamous episode of Cherokee removal, another case of forced disposal for a land grab, was motivated precisely because the Cherokee's well-developed constitutional government and the economic flourishing that accompanied the agricultural parts. Like the Cherokee, the Herero threatened the colonial project simply by thriving. Terra Nullius was the goal rather than the precondition of German colonialism. <clears throat> Excuse me. These resonances or rehearsals of settler colonial logics in vastly different contexts are reminders that these were not merely nation making projects, but world making ones. If I can refashion a life that Adam Gratitude uses to speak of the anti colonial projects, genocide in these settler colonial spaces was not a bilateral project, but a global one. This is not an argument of singular world history, but that there was a vital intimacy between these different diverse sites, you know, the way in which Lisa Lau um, uh, theorizes it, that the metaphor of rehearsals might capture because they can all be seen as different takes on an imperial world system. These different colonial theaters of genocide are sometimes competing, sometimes disconnected. They may sometimes serve as places where particular methods and strategies are tried out, creatively experimented with, and with sometimes stages for very different practices. This way of telling the story of genocide may also sit uncomfortably with repressive approaches to reparations in international law, which has been predicated on a model of remedies for discrete international crimes. For instance, in telescoping attention into the extermination order, the received genocide framing also treats colonialism as a series of humanitarian wrongs rather than a structural dimension of world systems. The nexus of race and property, the shutting down of alternative in, uh, international parts, and the assimilation into the world system, this suggests that the reparations discussion has to engage with the project of unmaking the world, interrupting its normalcy, not merely ameliorating injury and, and acknowledging harm. Indeed, it suggests that the received models of genocide is itself a product of the racial capitalist system, that an alternative framing of reparations would aim to challenge. This way of telling the story of genocide sits come uncomfortably with the convention and the requirements of genocidal intent that international criminal law has demanded. Alan Freeman, another critical race theorist, tells the story of liberal legalist approaches to American discrimination law as manifesting what he describes as a perpetrator perspective, in that they have focused on discriminatory intent, in contrast to what he calls the victim perspective that focuses on the structural factors that reproduce discrimination even after it has been declared illegal. In some senses, alternative visions of genocide and the work of genocide convention can be understood through a similar logic. Indeed, it helps us understand how genocide keeps happening, not in the periphery of the world system, not by just so-called rogue states like Sudan or Myanmar, but by powerful states that enjoy the support of the most powerful institutions of global governance, from the Security Council to NATO. When I began writing this um, paper, part of my interest was to approach the question of genocide and reparations by bringing together sort of a left trail tradition with critical race theory and indigenous studies. I wanted to challenge the notion of genocide that is framed through biology talk and culture talk while neglecting political economy uh, um, to show that there was a racially maldistributive architecture to the framing of a crime that is supposed to be the apex critique of racial atrocity. Further, while historically genocide uh, analysis is focused on racial hate aimed at victims, I was interested in connecting the dots between different projects of race making. How does one think about whiteness as a global process of imperial identity formation? What does that open up and what are the limits of that framing? Further building on the work of indigenous studies, scholarship on settler colonialism as a structure, not an event, I wanted to challenge the notion of genocide that separates extermination from exploitation and disconnects destruction from dispossession. While holding on to the trail insight to foreground the global stakes, the questions of world making and unmaking. I don't think I achieved all of that, but hopefully see the ground for additional work in all of those directions. The process of writing is always a process of learning and writing in community with other traditions. In this case, for me, it was also about thinking not just with international lawyers, but also playwrights and historians, folks writing about Namibian constitutional law and folks writing about American constitutional law. Critical scholars such as Nahid Samur, Mahmoud Mamdani, Alex Dival, and others have helped us think critically about the work of the term genocide in international criminal law and human rights. 
It is like close, but I want to foreground is another dimension of the writing process. And the intellectual and political solidarities that challenge the conditions of scholarly production. As I was writing this talk and pulling together various threads of the critique of the category of genocide, as it has traveled to us in international law, I was also signing various statements condemning genocide, invoking international law. <laughs> I think many of you may have signed many of those statements, very same statements as well. Some have argued that what Israel is doing today to the Palestinian rehearses, Palestinians rehearses what Jews suffered in the Holocaust, or that the horrors that Hamas inflicted was an anticipatable boomerang of what the Palestinians have suffered in the past 25 years. And boomerang, um, so one of the sections that I uh, excised from this is, of course, a term that everyone, uh, that a range of people from Amy Sisseya to Hannah Arendt used to speak about the relationship between genocide in the colonies and genocide in Europe. Because yet, as Cesare reminds us, what is most telling is not just how horrific violence boomerangs, but the long life of the horrors of indifference to its victims. After the genocide that we are all witnessing today is not one that began on October 7th, uh, on October 9th, when Israeli Minister of Defense, Yov Galan, declared that they were imposing a complete siege on Gaza. No electricity, no water, no fuel, everything is closed. We are fighting human animals and we will act accordingly. The genocide did not begin on October 10th when IDF spokesperson Daniel Hagari said that hundreds of tons of bombs had already been dropped and the goal was damage, not on accuracy. Equating Benjamin Netanyahu's promise to flatten Gaza and its 2.3 million civilians. The genocide did not begin when the Knesset member Maven uh, Benari declared on the 16th the children of Gaza have brought this upon themselves. Rather, genocide had already begun, going, had already been going on, inch by inch, bit by bit, as settlements were expanding and bulldozers of flattening homes and olive groves. We were already witness to genocide five years ago, 10 years ago, 75 years ago. It is in that spirit that I want to end by drawing, drawing from the speech, um, from the poem, Speech of the Red Indian by Mahmoud Davish, that doesn't speak directly to what was happening in Palestine, but links it line by line, verse by verse, to what took place in the Americas. It is, I believe, an expression of solidarity, but also of political analysis of the logic of genocide and its history. The speech of the Red Indian by Mahmoud Dervish. So we are who we are as the Mississippi flows, and what remains from yesterday is still ours, but the color of the sky has changed. The sea to the east has changed. <clears throat> from the river to the sea, we might say. In this case, from the Mississippi River, in Dervish's words, to the sea to the east the Black Atlantic itself a briny graveyard of genocide. But then Dervish goes on. Our pastures are sacred, our spirits inspired, the stars are luminous words where our fable is legible from the beginning to end. If only you lift up your eyes, be born between water and fire, reborn in clouds on an azure show after Judgment Day. So Judgment Day, is Dervish telling us to wait for the court in The Hague to issue its judgment? to tell us what atrocities international law can tolerate, even if only to name or condemn post facto. But perhaps Darvish is much more skeptical about the law and treaty, the commandments from The Hague or the conventions of peace and war. We are tending our last fires, he says. We fail to acknowledge your greetings. Don't write commandments from your new steel god for us. Don't demand peace treaties from the dead. I refuse to sign a treaty between victim and killer. I refuse to sign a bill of sale that takes possession of so much as one inch of my weed patch, of so much as one inch of my cornfield, even if it's my last salutation to the sun. Enter your brutal statues of liberty over my corpse. Engrave your iron crosses on my stony shadow. There are dead and there are colonies. There are dead and there are bulldozers. There are dead and there are hospitals. There are dead and there are radar screens to observe the dead as they die more than once in this life. Perhaps Darvish is saying that the courtrooms built by the Genocide Convention is no home for the dead. So Darvish again, in rooms you build, the dead's, dead are already asleep. Or you who are guests in this place, leave a few chairs empty for your host to read out the conditions of for peace in a treaty with the dead. Thank you, Professor, for this insightful lecture. Um, I'm now opening for Q&A, if someone would like to ask some questions. Well. OK, great. Uh, thank you very much, Pasuki. That was really rich. I have lots of questions. And I will, uh, I will uh, control myself. I have to, in my mind, I choose one. Um, but of course, 
Um, one of uh, my favorite things about your um, discussion of the topic is that you take into account uh, the socioeconomic uh, context in which both the law on genocide emerges and in which the genocides uh, that you've discussed um, have happened. And, and the way that um, those two things interact, of course, right? So the, the, the genocides that have happened in, in Namibia, the genocide that has happened in Namibia has fed into how the law is then drafted uh, in the 1940s. Oh, yeah. um, I, I wondered, um, given that the, um, that much of colonialism uh, was uh, a project that was carried out by corporations. And in Namibia also, we have the German Southwest Africa Company. And um, I wondered if you um, would be able to say something about what that brings to the story specifically. <laughs> Sure, um, you probably are much more informed than I am, but uh, I'll just say it's a very preliminary. I do think that, you know, in thinking of genocide um, outside of the framework of nation state, um, that we are, uh, you know, so the Herero and Nama are offering one challenge to that in terms of thinking about, you know, um, many indigenous communities and many other, many minority communities in many parts of the world that don't frame themselves or their identities or have political um, subjectivity to the category of, of nation state. Similarly, of course, in terms of colonization itself. And yeah, Germany is a great example where, you know, essentially um, individual traders who were the, 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 the front end, as it were, of, um, uh, of the colonization process. And then like colonization, uh, uh, and, and then these um, companies as, as with uh, colonization processes in, in many European empires. Were the, were the were the front guard um in in some sense and also you know were probably um the greatest beneficiaries rather than you know, um the poor Germans in the or working class Germans or the peasantry in whose name colonization um took place as well um so I think yeah so that's very much a part of the story now and I think there is some value like there have been for instance in a, a range of these cases I mean um about uh, efforts to look at the role of private actors and particularly private corporations. Um, and certainly that a lot of the work around um, from BDS to whatever has been about, um, you know, companies that have um, investments in the settlements or about, you know, so, and I think that's useful, you know, not, not, not just in the local sense of a boycott and, you know, on people's markets and so on, but also because it tells us something about the way the system works. So that that if I want wants to speak about this as a world making system, then the world making is also about the role of um, corporate actors um, as well. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, lovely to see you last again. Thank you very much for this really powerful talk. This is very important, I think, in the framing of which. All of us sooner or later will have to invest ourselves in order to account for some of what's happening right now, but also in terms of our own kind of the colonial scholarship and so on. It is both, I suppose, a, a, a space of uh, hope in terms of how you live in solidarity with that world, but also a space of intense trauma. And I wonder how you eventually cope with all that. To that end, I wonder uh, if you can foresee alternatives, if any, to. Uh, Investing in the case, before the ICJ, and hoping that something it will lead and yield uh, eventually, or signing of the petition process that we go to. Other than that, sort of a civic action, I suppose, and then and legal action to some degree. What else could we possibly imagine at this point of the critical time? I wonder, for instance, with respect to what happened in Bosnia and in Brussels. Uh, what are the prospects after genocide? Are we in a lateral humanitarian intervention? Are we as critical words still to police and just universally say that this is simply forbidden? This is simply legal? Or are there ways to understand the difference and specifically with respect to the role of the Security Council once again proven completely mm -hmm. in effect to say the least? If not to elaborate in the efforts uh, of those who pursue genocide. I wonder what self-determination during and after genocide might look like. 
in terms of a big critical legal perspectives. Is there something to this cell, this set of our resistance in the way it is framed, at least through Quayle and other critical perspectives, uh, that is specifically geared towards uh, ending genocide and then uh, living in a post genocidal society, which, as the Bosnian situation suggests, is, is probably much worse than what happens during mm -hmm. the genocide. And finally, how does genocide mobilize international law and its fields of intervention differently than in other war situations? Okay. <laughs> a, lot, a, lot of, a lot of questions. <laughs> uh, so maybe I'll, I'll take a couple of them. One, so one thing about the case, yeah. that I do think the value of the case, at least from my uh, perspective, is, is really not about the court's decision. Yeah. but just the fact of the case yeah. um, and its performance on our screens and in our newspapers and so on and then you know radios all over the world that it's that you know i, I, I sort of refer to it as a bandung moment and it's a bandung moment in that performance in some sense because they are the case you know in some sense described what is happening in gaza um in ways that resonated with you know um um with you know uh, uh, a whole range of it with perhaps the global south the way the global south saw it with the way you know uh, people in solidarity with palestine in the global north saw it that the it was the in that sense it was an alternative to a dominant media hegemony and i think you know the idea of law serving functions to which law was itself not designed is is useful i think in thinking about that sometimes law's biggest purpose is not what law says it is doing um, and not so not that judgment in some sense. So that's that's one thing. And also, yeah, so that that was that that seems um important, but it also seems important to um, you know, that that's it's not it's a it's a both a performance that's that's um you know probably lifted our spirits in this moment of despair uh in as it as it happened, but also of course it's enormously seductive in ways that can also be also be um to the to the ends of law rather than to the ends of solidarity and resistance. So um, you know that that is so that many of these things are that it's impossible to escape the challenge that goes with it. And then um, maybe the other thing that I'll respond to in your sort of wonderful array and of rich question <laughs> is that um, is it what the post genocide? So I mean I think you know this is why I think that Trail Two has to learn from um, indigenous scholars and the indigenous studies because in a sense it's about. You know, because so clearly one of their insights is, of course, that there is no post genocide. Genocide is an is part of what we are living with with every day, and that every you know every moment where you know we at invite you expands to an extra building, or or even I buy my house in Brooklyn. Those those are all. It's all you know um, a profit from a genocide. It's uh, something that's reproducing it all, all all the time in some sense. So I mean, I think at the um, so I think so partly about that. It's about unsettling the notion of genocide as being something that's in the past, um, and constantly reminding ourselves, treating that as something that's going to disrupt the present. And that, the, and I think that's the value of reparations claims in general. Mm -hmm. That it's a it's an interruption mm -hmm. in in that sense of a certain kind of normalcy. Um, and so that's one dimension of the post genocide uh, discussion is about that to trouble the post. Um, and I think part of that is also then about solidarity. So I think, you know, you, very specifically and very very concretely in terms of, I think, how the social movement stuff worked in the U.S., um, you know, when Black Lives Matter, in the post-George Floyd world, uh, Black Lives Matter came up in their uh, manifesto, it was very explicitly through solidarity with Palestinian groups and learning from indigenous groups. Um, you know, it was um, after we had had all of these protests around the uh, pipelines built across the uh, across North America and so on. And I think those solidarities were quite critical to the current moment and as backdrop to the current moment and the enabling conditions of the current moment. And this is why you have, you know, at NYU and elsewhere, you know, um, hordes of young people who have a completely different view about Palestine than their parents. Um, and many young Jewish um, students who are so critical of critical of Zionism, critical of um, you know the kinds of complicities of um, the American administration in a way that their parents were not. Um, and I think it is partly because of this social movement work that happened with um, the the pipeline protests, the Native American protests, the 
um, the, the Black Lives Matter and Palestine, that, that they build a different knowledge and different awareness, at least in the US context. And so I'm being quite parochial here in terms of how I understand how that social movement emerged, um, a different view about the racialized nature of governance. Um, and that, so that I think that was, that's a critical backdrop. So that's the other thing about, you know, how do we, how do we make community or build community in this sort of quote unquote post genocide is in some sense, um, sometimes through that kind of. Hello? Hi, sorry, it's video. Yeah. <laughs> can, you, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, sorry, I have a question, but I, I don't know if anyone else uh, wants to speak, but I don't know if you mind, I'm just jumping in. Go ahead, Miguel. Yeah, no, I actually, um, so Vasuki, I heard uh, a different version of this paper in London Review, and I was just wondering if you could um, tell me uh, a little bit more about the play and how you see um, theatre and literature either informing our understanding of genocide in the present, as well as historically when it comes to comparisons, I think. Um, I really enjoyed that part of it. And I'm just wondering whether or not you've taken it further in terms of your analysis um, of the play's reference, uh, the play's um, relevance to what's going on today. May I just, uh, I have a related question uh, because I, I really enjoy your use of literature uh, to, to frame uh, law. And building up on, on Vidya's question, I wonder how literature or theater or art uh, can help us in resituating, deconstructing, and understanding laws, implications, and history, and but also reimagining um, new futures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, good. I mean, so no, thank you. So um, yeah, so I, you know, for reasons of time, because I want to have, you know, ensure that we had enough time for discussion. I took off the explicit references to the play, um, but it's sort of analytical work in how I think about it remained in some sense. So, um, so let me, uh, for those who are, don't know the play, let me ex explain a bit. So in the earlier version, I had um, discussed uh, these issues next to um, a story of a, <laughs> next to a play by a Jackie Sibbis uh, jury, who is a you know, black American playwright, although this particular play, um, it also, it was um, uh, um, uh, 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 was staged in London, um, and it's a play about it's a play about the Harare and Nama genocide. Um, the playwright she herself encounters this play, you know, when she's a uh, uh, when when she's in college, um, and she then performs. Then she writes this play. Um, yeah, uh, through that, I mean. Partly she writes this play, she says, because she's shocked that she hadn't heard about the Haredo and Nama genocide um, so late in her, even though she was a student of colonialism, she was, you know, all of these things and somehow it has sort of disappeared from history and the German colonial story has sort of disappeared from the history that she learned. Um, and she sees a magazine where she sees, a, she, I think, maybe a story about these reparations claims of someone who looks like her own grandmother. And then she then she goes and digs deeper and then she, she uh, I think. So this play, and then this play itself is an interesting one. And this uh, is that it's, it's, it's uh, six actors, um, three white, three black, and they are performing. And what you, the whole script of the play is a rehearsal. So what you see is actually these three six actors saying, "Let's rehearse what we are going to do," and that's the whole the whole thing is that. So it's a concept of. So you may have heard me talk about rehearsal. You know, you may not necessarily attract it, but I use the word rehearsal a lot, and I think of the the concept of the work of the rehearsals do, you know, continued in the this in the paper that I presented today. But um, but that was in some sense inspired by the work of the play in terms of. Um, fronting the work of rehearsal. And partly because Namibia is often described, the Rebellion against Herero and Nama is often described as a rehearsal for the Holocaust, right? So the, the concept of rehearsal has many different things. What does it mean for, and then in the play, in fact, there's a there's this one, one, there's one piece of dialogue where someone says, um, you know, this was a rehearsal for the Holocaust and the other, and someone else, and another actor responds saying, you know, if it's done to real people, it's not a rehearsal, it's a real thing, it's their lives. Um, you know, it's not that the main actors in Europe and the, and this rehearsal is in the colonies and so on. So there's many ways in which how we understand what is the main action of genocide, where does it really take place? And so it's also in that sense a meditation about 
um, the ways of Holocaust exceptionalism in some sense. And that's a, um, and this and part of the part of I suppose my goal in this paper is also to um, look at the many different kinds of Holocaust uh, of or gen Holocaust or genocides that have happened all over the world through the last 500 years um, as and the word uh, the the concept of rehearsal is the way in which I think about those and they are all and so you know in conjunction with both you know thinking of this as a as, as multiple rehearsals world making there is no one particular event so how do we we don't want I mean so I'm also resistant to the idea of a single global story um, and the rehearsals there's an each rehearsal is a different kind of performance each time it's very particular and each time there may be some experimentation by the actors as there are in that particular play as well um, that it's remade differently um, so what happens in the Americas and what happens in um, in, in Bosnia or what happens in um, in in um, southwest German Southwest Africa, uh, what happens in Gaza? That these are have a relationship with each other, a relationship that that the concept of rehearsal may help us um, uh, may may help us through thinking about that relationship. Um, and without so it's about so that's in some sense um, in a, in a nutshell <laughs> some of the work of the work of the play as a sort of it, it's a thread that sort of runs through runs through my analysis in different kinds of ways. And so as I said, that's why you can see some of the analytical work in what I presented today, but um, but just for, for brevity, I had taken out the description of the play. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, um, hi, it's so lovely to meet you and thank you so much for such an amazing talk. Um, I'm one of the PhD students here at City and uh, my PhD is looking at the interstate adjudication of atrocity crimes. So the Gambi yeah, Myanmar case study is one of my main uh, case studies in the PhD. And But I did a lot of genocide studies in my undergrad and master's to prepare for this. And I, I was really um, compelled by your examples about the rehearsal concept in the play, because there is such an interesting discourse about comparative genocide scholarship. Mm -hmm. And we see it as well in um, some of the discourse about the Armenian genocide, right? There's a lot of, um, I think there was a statement that a lot of people refer to that Hitler had said, which was, who remembers the plight of the Armenians in sort of his preparations for uh, the final solution? And of course, you know, and this goes into the definition of genocide in the Genocide Convention, right? It was very much um, limited by main powers, so primarily the USSR and the US, in order to not um, be held to account for the genocide or genocidal acts against Black Americans and the Native Americans, as well as uh, in Ukraine. But how do you think we can? Um, how, I guess, would we try to kind of, uh, I'm trying to find the right word, but really reconcile ourselves with this discourse, considering not just Gaza, but also uh, what's happening with the Rohingya, what's happening with Sudan, but also what's happening to Kurds in Turkey and all of these different, we're seeing this happening in quote unquote third world um, countries, but I, sorry, I'm really struggling with how to uh, say this question, but I guess to, to narrow it down, I was very compelled by uh, Nicaragua's recent filing against Germany. Mm -hmm. And that being about the prevention and punishment of genocide by Germany's lack of condemnation of Israel and also sending uh, armed forces or mm -hmm. uh, weapons. And you know, how, how do we as scholars try to reconcile with the law acting in this way? And then as well, how do we, do we need to remake the Genocide mm -hmm. Convention as an international law scholar? That seems quite an insurmountable task. Mm -hmm. So very big question, but I don't know uh, if it came through or not. So I was right. very, yeah, I was very compelled by that rehearsal exam. Right, right. Yeah, no, thank you. So I mean, there's, there's, um, yeah, lots of, lots of great questions and um, point to think about, think about in there. I mean, I think one element of it, and this is perhaps what you find compelling about the Nicaragua thing, and, and um, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it shows us the genocide was, you know, again, to, to, to refer back to that quote from um, 
um, Adam get to show that it's the genocide is not a bilateral process but a war making process. And so it is not Israel versus Gaza, but you know Israel is embedded in a system of global governance, um, mm -hmm. and that um, there are many people that have enabled and are part of what makes Israel possible in some sense. So, um, so the Nicaragua case, in a sense, is about is 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 about is about that 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 frame that is what it shows and how so much of sort of say domestic politics in Germany about who gets punished, what kind of speech is allowed, that all that is actually. In, in, intimately linked to this world making project as well, mm -hmm. right? That what seems so local about whether this protest can take place or whether this person gets a prize or whether this person is recognized or not recognized. Um, all that policing is related to, in some sense, a particular notion of global governance. So I think that's so I think that that's that's one um one one element of it. Um I have sorry, I lost my thought. I had one more thing I wanted to respond to you when I um um Will it come back to me? So, um, so sorry. So that's one. Uh, that's one. You're very rich question. Yes, sure. Well, um, it's also very interesting because Nicaragua has a history of genocide against oh yeah sure. indigenous population. Sure. So that's there's yes. this weird almost I hate to use the term cognitive dissonance in in the sense of, but what about your indigenous population? Where is the reckoning there? Because there has been not transition to Yes. Yes. No. I, that I think very important because I think you know that's I think why you know so you know Trail certainly in the current version of Trail has certainly been very skeptical about the nation state and has been quite critical about the disappointments of the nation state that perhaps you know people in the fifties, sixties, you know um, from um, the global south fighting decolonial struggles um, were much more optimistic and uh, uh, so I think that's but that's partly why but so. Notwithstanding that skepticism that we have about nation state, and notwithstanding that we have no illusions that the nation state is going to be, in some sense, an arbiter of freedom, uh, there hasn't been enough learning. I think even myself. So this is this project is partly, you know, was one of the things I wanted. I'm doing. I mean, in addition to a, a few others, but this project definitely is a project of learning from um, Indian studies and from other traditions that have. So you know, Nicaragua is not going to be our savior any more than. Um, uh, so that's it's about also that skepticism, um, in some sense, has to inform. And our disappointments with, um, you know, earlier versions of freedom um, should not, um, you know, should not limit in some sense the way in which we find uh, we, we find possibilities today. Um, but um, oh yeah, which actually reminds me of what I was going to say that I forgot, which is uh, uh, which is the genocide convention. You said that do we need a new genocide? Uh, so my position on this is it's it's really we are not going to, so there's not going to be a new genocide convention that's going to be you know all our hopes and dreams. Um, what we need to do in the other, on the other hand, so. You know, like I do think that in the in the South Africa uh, bringing that case, use the genocide convention, there was a huge value in that. We are bringing in my, there is huge value in that. But for you know, in the way that I've sort of framed the in ways that were perhaps not what the genocide convention intended. And so I think what we are in what it does in those kinds of interventions, and perhaps there are even more disruptive ones. We are unmaking the convention even when we are invoking them, and we have to do that in some sense with greater political and legal imagination. Um, then um, uh, you know that's partly what the what the agenda is in some sense. I would say that you know if this whole phrase makes us phase you know to, to resist, resist in some sense the seductions of of uh, the decide convention as being in some sense the thing that's going to save us, we need to also try to think of different ways in which we can um, we can um, challenge it or not be faithful to the convention on the way the convention is expected. So. Um, you know, it, it shouldn't really be about what what the, the ICJ decides. I mean, you know, it, perhaps it's important for the institution of the ICJ, ICJ. But in terms of the broader questions around Palestine solidarity and about you know other kind, the, it shouldn't. It's really not about what the court. So the ICJ is not you know is is not going to be some um, oracle of Delphi that's going to issue out chutz um, and um That's that's about us. We have a question from Zoom. Yes, uh, we have a question that kind of leads on from this. So perhaps you um, partially covered this. It's from uh, Nora Jabber. So Nora says, hi, thank you so much for the talk. I wonder whether you could expand on your signing of letters invoking international law to prevent or acknowledge the genocide in Gaza and how you 
reconciled that with the serious limitations of the international framing of genocide that you described in your work. Is there a worry that this legitimizes the international legal framework in a sense? I suppose this question also applies to your thoughts on the ICJ case. Yeah, sure. No, I mean, yes, no, I mean, I think it does. It, it, uh, um, it, it's the signing of those things is, means it's not a sort of, sort of clean project of political engagement. And I also think there's no clean political engagement. So every time one takes uh, one does something, there's all one is also taking various kinds of political risks because one is always legitimizing things that we don't want to legitimize. Um, and one is always, um, you know, so when Susanna very, very um, nicely and generously read out, uh, you know, various kinds of um, things in the in my introduction, those are all complicit institutions, right? So like every single thing on our CVs and on our whatever pages and so on, those are all complicit. When every every signing of these things, every the re, you know, all of those are things that are that are, are dirty waters in some sense, and that we are um, and we but we we have it feels like in many cases we can't but swim in them, but we have to choose. We have to make those. That doesn't mean that we do. We have to do it thoughtlessly that each time we should hold ourselves accountable to what choices we're making clearly. And so I think that's a, it's useful that whatever the, the um, Nora Jaiba, right, who asked this question, I think that's a question we should keep with us all the time so that we should, whenever we sign a statement, we should we should actually conduct a distributive analysis. Is it doing more good or bad? And who knows whether it's doing more, that, that may depend on each particular context. There are many contexts where it may, it may be better not to sign and there may be better, when a context to sign, you know, it's like what Marx's reflections on the Jewish question, whether to sign or not to sign. Um, I think that's, that's what I would foreground as a kind of thought process we need to undertake. Other question for you? Some, some yeah. uh, thank you very much for that. And that and also the acknowledgement of the difference between uh, Jewish culture in America and perhaps in the UK. I think it's extremely a challenge. Um, and and you getting such a sense of that as a woman is very appreciated. Um, my question is, uh, and again, you speak much more extensively than myself. You mentioned how Italy ways is pretty much hidden in the background when the one the genesis of the definition of genocide, and and would later on develop that to become more forefront of the conversation. Um, acknowledging that, in essence, is not so. So we we use law as a tool in the criminal structure, and but would you be comfortable to say that? The politicizing of the Jew has, has created a much more intense um, conversation to the extent that it's back, it's kind of put in the back of the average more indigenous Jew. So it's got a much more contested and challenging I don't know, future to look at. And if so, how would you recommend managing that in the dialogue as important as this one today? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I don't think I would. I yeah, I may not frame it like that, or I don't think I see it like that because um, I really don't think that it's about the Jews have got too much attention compared to indigenous people. Um, I think what I what I am pointing out to. So I I don't believe that that's the case. I believe what's the case is that Germany, Europe, the the most powerful countries in the world have got more have got too much power in arbitrating what is um what is a violation that requires us to be that uh, to be challenged and what isn't um so it is not so much about um so i think you know so you know my own sense is that most many things um the that these are that the, the uh, position and the situation of um uh, jewish survivors or the Jewish dead, those are positions that we have, those are relations of solidarity, um, not of comparison in terms of relative oppression or attention. Um, but the but the but I guess what when my critique of genocide convention um and its own production from in some sense the uh the end of World War II was that is but who it empowers is is not necessarily Jewish people, even I mean, who it empowers. Uh, um, you know the 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 NATO and the Security Council and the you know in some sense the systems of global governance that we have today. Um, so um, so yeah. So I guess that's how I would both respond to your question and that's how I also see in some sense how we understand the relationship between different communities 
um, and how um, who may be um, who have suffered genocide or who are suffering genocide, and and again, if I can go back again, sorry, excuse my parochialism, uh, but if I go back to the U.S. context, um, many of the groups that are sort of denying uh, or you know uh, addressing the or denying the uh, uh, the genocide against Palestine or justifying it and so on are also deeply anti-Semitic. Um, and so if there's a way, I mean, and I think that that fact in some sense is a, is a telling fact. It's not an accident um, that that, and so um, so it's really, a, in some ways, a conversation about white supremacy of a particular kind of, of a particular kind as well. So that's part of what I mean when I say it's a race-making project. It's a, it's, and, the, um, and that's partly what Cheryl Harris is talking about when she talks about the, um, the property interest in whiteness, that this is real, it's, it's, it, it's about the race of the oppressor um, that that I would want to foreground. So, yeah. So, um, like, despite the limitations of existing Geneva Convention, uh, potentially one of the few kind of uh, anti-hegemonic ways to which that definition and framework could be forged is perhaps being put in this context. Mm -hmm. But then there's an argument, uh, this uh, Palestinian author, the word of peace, but was dropped by Howard Law Review mm -hmm. at the height of violence in Gaza. He makes this argument that though it will be covered within the narrow frame of genocide, but at the same time, it is an injustice to all that that has been folded over the last 70 years. Uh, with the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. So that recognition of Nabka, that has to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we like, uh, one we give up on the recognition of that uh, experience of Palestinians. If one invokes, though in a counter hegemonic ways, this narrow entity of genocide that, that exists. Mm -hmm. So what do you? Like, yes, no, I think that that's completely right. That in fact, if it if you reduce genocide to something that's purely about the last five months, that will be that that's a that's a problem. That we have to think of genocide as something that has been happening. I mean, not it's a problem because also also inaccurate to how the last five months became possible. The enabling conditions of the last five months has been the last twenty five years. Um, and so um, we have to think of genocide, and this is you know this is sort of one key inside of Indian studies of thinking about it as structure, not event, is about thinking about it as a as a long-term historical process. So when um, you know Justice Marshall rules about what constitutes a legitimate property law and what constitutes customary, that's a genocidal act. It's not only people who are dropping bombs. And it's so um so I agree with you. So I think, you know, it's of course there's never a tool that we cannot, you know, it's in, in the context at like we're living through at the moment, you may have we may have to use many different kinds of tools. So we may have to use the inside convention in a particular, but then we also have to be attentive to the dangers of using it, precisely as you're saying. Um, and we should be also reminding people, it's an it's in some sense the moment to remind people about the last 25 years. Mm -hmm. right? It's, it's precisely the moment to, to do that. In some sense. So, um, so yeah, so that, that's great. And Gritya has another question. Yeah, so um, we, were, we were thinking, given that you're one of the founders of Thrill, um, what, and just to sort of zoom out a little bit, from, because we've been teaching Thrill and some of our students that are here uh, today, um, I wondered what you see as the main uh, sort of agenda points or the main project of Twill uh, today, and what's because we've learned about Twill in in sort of its historical iterations. Mm -hmm. But where are we with Twill today? Oh, um, yeah. I mean, I think that the answer is probably in this room because <laughs> I think one of the strengths of Twill has always been that there is no single. A group of person who's defined what twelve is like so twelve you know so I mean I think that's why with twelve with twelve themselves they're very conscious of their of of um I think it's uh, if I remember right it's Adil Khan who invokes this idea of claiming of a history or of claiming you know situating the fact that twelve did not appear out of nowhere in the nineteen nineties that it there were uh, important historic there were ancestors it's about so, and then there are many people who will remake twelve and I think that twelve is one good example of it but there are also many others there are people who are doing defining twelve in ten thousand different ways and I think um it would be a mistake 
um, for TWAIL to have in some sense an agenda, a singular agenda, that in fact, TWAIL is, you know, in some sense is a stance. I think I think of it TWAIL as a stance, as thinking of, you know, thinking about the global in term in ways that are attentive to um, um to the structures, to, to global structures and to the ways in which there's um uh, uh, the, the 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 questions of distribution of uh, you know um, what Guy Tispevac calls the always remember the international distribution of labor. <laughs> so it's a bit it's a that's I, that I think is part of what Twail is is doing. But in terms of specific agendas, that I think you know that a thousand flowers bloom. Maybe I sound a bit too liberal in that term. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. You have a question. Um, thanks for the talk. It was really thought provoking. I really find interesting the way you present the temporal aspect of the precursors to genocide, and also in one of your answers, how there is no post genocide and this concept of reversal and so on. But you also mentioned the concept of, I think, in, in your talk, of, of slow violence as well. Maybe you could expand on that a little bit and how the concept of slow violence is. Um, influencing your work and whether or not concepts of genocide, legal concepts of genocide could conceptualize okay. or capture forms of, of uh, different slow violence. I'm also thinking of things like environmental pollution and, sure. and sure. racism and other things. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, sure. So, I mean, I think, you know, like my answer to your question, uh, in some sense, that is really about thinking about genocide. In so genocide has often been about spectacular violence and sort of Rob Nixon's notion of slow violence of the, you know, he thinks of his uh, environmental injustices that the poor have, um, the pure poor have experience and experience every day, um, that those are parts of, part of what um, um, are the, uh, to think of genocide in structural terms as an ongoing process and so on, is about taking it's about connecting the dots between the slow and the spectacular. Um, and in some, in you know, that's why at the beginning I mentioned sort of the malnutrition in Gaza right now. And so sometimes the slow is really not so slow. Um, it's it it is uh, it 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 is um, of a scale and intensity that's that's very close to the spectacular. But those are all in some sense part of you know um, where the, uh, the uh, of you know uh, of a necropolitical landscape to use Ashil Mamem based terms. That the slow violence and the, the slow violence always had in, had in it the enabling conditions and the catalyst and the possibility of um, um, of, of spectacular violence and um, and that's what it means that's what uh, you know so uh, Memembe speaks about um, the plantation um, and then you know Gaz uh, Palestine is his other example the plantation or the colony as uh, being contexts where uh, they are always parts baked into the ground as it were. Is um, and that's the so slow violence is doing many different things and operating at many different time scales. It is operating on the one hand of you know slowly slow man, uh, nourishment, difficult of difficult of access to um, healthcare, of all of these sort of everyday problems of infrastructure and so on. In you know, it's part of what Nixon is talking about. But it also happens that all of those things, and this is part of I think also what you know the Amy Sasser boomerang thing is about. These as our indifference to all of those things is also what are the enabling conditions of um, genocidal violence. It's part of the dehumanization of Palestinians that has happened over the last 75 years um, that can enable this in some sense. And that happened through all of those, you know, the, the bombing of a bridge in Gaza here or a rest of, a, of a, um, no, not allowing medicine to go um, in uh, through 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 um, uh, various kinds of, through all the sanctions regimes, um, the various kinds of blockades and so on. So that those, you know, so Gaza may be a, exaggerated example of the convergence of the slow and the spectacular. Um, but in some sense, that's the world we live in all over. Right, yeah. I, it's because, you know, return to the question of the degree of violence, right? I think I entirely agree, of course, that most of the colonial scholars have been about the environment, included. Uh, but I wonder if uh, the urgency uh, of what you might call spectacular violence, except that it's also accelerated violence. Uh, the urgency of accelerated human and non-human killing on a daily basis in numbers that may seem spectacular uh, uh, requires different forms of intervention, including critical intervention. Yeah. Whether then the lack of that intervention uh, is another form of complexity or simply inability to frame one's response 
other than to the long delay mm -hmm. that, that, that theater is alive. Right. Right. No, I think so. I think it requires a different, I mean, surely it just requires, requires a different response, right? So like, you know, we're talking earlier about why we are signing petitions on Gaza and so on. Um, you know, maybe before October 7th, if there was a petition on sort of the human rights situation or the denial of economic and social rights in Gaza or something, maybe we would have signed that as well. But there would have been a more, it would have, this seems, of course, we need to sign a petition about genocide in Gaza, right? So it's, it's spectacular. There's the, the urgency, the speed, the imminence of whatever it's, you know, the there's no question. You have to you have to respond. A, a life is we, we value life in some way, and if it's if, if there's a life at risk in front of us, that um, I mean, not that any of the I, you know it's difficult to know whether any of this matters, um, and how it's mattering, uh, and whether it will, you know in what scale it matters. But um, it's at the very least, it's a sign that it matters. You know, like that that poem from I'm forgetting his name. Um, because my, my brain is a bit dead, but the of the person who, who died, who wrote about the kites, you know, let, let out a kite. You know, that it's, it's about that, that the signing is a bit of, it's a bit, a bit like a kite. It's a bit saying this life matters. So that we, it doesn't have to, it doesn't require our analysis of the political economy of um, land dispossession in Gaza, although we may be interested in that as well. It may be not, not about the uh, destruction of infrastructure, or about sanctions, all of those matter as well. But at its very core, life matters. Um, and all of those things are different ways of signaling that. And if there are other ways in which we can do it. Um, yeah, and I, I do I do feel acutely, and part of the despair at the moment is also an acute sense of, you know, certainly my, and I mean, I, uh, the lack of political and legal imagination to think of other things that we could do that could actually matter. None of it, I mean, so this is all like, it feels a bit like flailing in a world where, Okay, so I think we can end with this question. Thank you once again for coming, Professor. No, thank you so much. This was this was incredibly Also, we don't have any events coming up uh, at the Center for Law and Social Change, but we have a spring school on law and Marxist methods. Um, if you're working with uh, third world uh, Marxism, feminist Marxist, uh, queer and trans Marxist methods. Send us uh, an application. You can find all the details on our Twitter and website. Yeah, I guess that's all. Uh, we are looking forward to it. It will be on the 9th and 10th of May. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for that. Thank you.